Hey guys, my name is Jean. I'm gonna read books to you. Hopefully this will be something that I do with a few books that I enjoy. I'm inspired by my friend Kyle who reads books on his channel which is uh, KYL391. Uh, he's known for reading Fifty Shades of Grey and right now we're reading Bared to You by Sylvia Day. So now on my own channel I'd like to start reading books of my own and I own a lot of books. It took some time to decide which book I was going to read. I actually have a lot of advanced copies of books from working at a bookstore, but I'm not really allowed to read those. One, they're uncorrected proofs, so they're not even the accurate published version. And two, some of them aren't even published yet. So I looked through my closet where I have all my stacks of books stored, and I found my collection from when I took a gay and lesbian literature class in college and that was one of the best classes I ever took so I decided to read one of those. So for you today I'm going to be reading Ruby Fruit Jungle by Rita Mae Brown. Now some of you may recognize her name. She's actually the author of all those cat mystery books but this is one of her first novels. It's about a girl named Molly who's growing up lesbian in America. So, today I'm going to read one or two chapters. They're a little short. By the end of the video, I'll see how many I feel like reading tonight. I hope you enjoy it. So this is chapter one of Ruby Fruit Jungle. No one remembers her beginnings. Mothers and aunts tell us about infancy and early childhood, hoping we won't forget the past when they had total control over our lives and secretly praying that because of it, we'll include them in our future. I didn't know anything about my own beginnings until I was seven years old, living in Coffee Hollow, a rural dot outside of York, Pennsylvania. A dirt road connected tar-papered houses filled with smear-faced kids, and the air was always thick with the smell of coffee beans freshly ground in the small shop that gave the place its name. One of those smear-faced kids was Brockhurst Detweiler, Broccoli for short. It was through him that I learned I was a bastard. Broccoli didn't know I was a bastard, but he and I struck a bargain that cost me my ignorance. One crisp September day, Broccoli and I were on our way home from Violet Hill Elementary School. Hey Molly, I gotta take a leak. Wanna see me? Sure, Brock. He stepped behind the bushes and pulled down his zipper with a flourish. Broccoli, what's all that skin hanging around your dick? My mom says I haven't had it cut up yet. What do you mean, cut up? She says that some people get this operation and the skin comes off and it has something to do with Jesus. Well, I'm glad no one's gonna cut up on me. That's what you think. My Aunt Louise got her tit cut off. I ain't got no tits. You will. You'll get big floppy ones, just like my mom. They hang down below her waist and wobble when she walks. Not me. I ain't gonna look like that. Oh, yes, you are. All girls look like that. You shut up or I'll knock your lips down your throat, Broccoli Detweiler. I'll shut up if you don't tell anyone I showed you my thing. What's there to tell? All you got is a wad of pink wrinkles hanging around it. It's ugly. It is not ugly. Ha! It looks awful. You think it's not ugly because it's yours. No one else has a dick like that. My cousin Leroy, Ted, no one. I bet you got the only one in the world. We ought to make some money off it. Money? How are we going to make money off my dick? After school, we can take the kids back here and show you off, and we charge a nickel apiece. No, I ain't showing people my thing if they're going to laugh at it. Look, Brock, money is money. What do you care if they laugh? You'll have money, then you can laugh at them. And we split 50-50. The next day during recess, I spread the news. Broccoli was keeping his mouth shut. I was afraid he'd chicken out, but he came through. After school, about 11 of us hurried out to the woods between school and the coffee shop, and there Brock revealed himself. He was a big hit. Most of the girls had never even seen a regular dick, and Broccoli's was so disgusting they shrieked with pleasure. Brock looked a little green around the edges, but he bravely kept it hanging out until everyone had a good look. We were 55 cents richer. Word spread through the other grades, 
and for about a week after that, Broccoli and I had a thriving business. I bought red licorice and handed it out to all my friends. Money was power. The more red licorice you had, the more friends you had. Leroy, my cousin, tried to horn in on the business by showing himself off, but he flopped because he didn't have skin on him. To make him feel better, I gave him 15 cents out of every day's earnings. Nancy Cathill came every day after school to look at broccoli, billed as the strangest dick in the world. Once she waited until everyone else had left, Nancy was all freckles and rosary beads. She giggled every time she saw broccoli, and on that day, she asked if she could touch him. Broccoli stupidly said yes. Nancy grabbed him and gave a squeal. Okay, okay, Nancy, that's enough. You might wear him out, and we have other customers to satisfy. That took the wind out of her, and she went home. Look, Broccoli, what's the big idea of letting Nancy touch you for free? That ought to be worth at least a dime. We ought to let kids do it for a dime, and Nancy can play for free when everyone goes home if you want her to. Deal. This new twist drew half the school into the woods. Everything was fine until Earl Stanback ratted on us to Miss Martin, the teacher. Miss Martin contacted Carrie and Broccoli's mother, and it was all over. When I got home that night, I didn't even get through the door when Carrie yelled, Molly, come in here right this minute. The tone in her voice told me I was up for getting strapped. I'm coming, Mom. What's this I hear about you out in the woods playing with Brockhurst Detweiler's Peter? Don't lie to me now. Earl told Miss Martin you're out there every night. Not me, Mom. I never played with him. Which was true. Don't lie to me, you big mouth brat. I know you're out there jerking that dimwit off, and in front of all the other brats in the hollow. No, Mom, honest, I didn't do that. There was no use telling her what I really did. She wouldn't have believed me. Carrie assumed all children lied. You shamed me in front of all the neighbors, and I've got a good mind to throw you out of this house. You and your high and mighty ways, sailing in the house and out the house as you damn well please. You reading them books and putting on airs. You're a fine one to be snotty. Miss Ups, out there in the woods, playing with his old dong. Well, I got news for you, you little shit ass. You think you're so smart. You ain't so fine as you think you are, and you ain't mine either. I don't want you to know. And I don't want you now that I know what you're about. Want to know who you are, smarty pants? You're Ruby Drawlinger's bastard. That's who you are. Now let's see who put your nose in the air. Who's Ruby Drawlinger? Your real mother, and that's who she was, a slut. You hear me, Miss Molly? A common, dirty slut who lay with a dog if it shook its ass right. I don't care. It makes no difference where I came from. I'm here, ain't I? It makes all the difference in the world. Them that's born in wedlock are blessed by the Lord. Them that's born out of wedlock are cursed as bastards. So there. I don't care. Well, you ought to care, you horse's ass. Just see how far all your pretty ways and books get you when you go out and people find out you're a bastard. And you act like one blood's thicker than water, and yours tells. Bullheaded like Ruby and out there in the woods jerking off that debt wild idiot. Bastard. Carrie was red in the face and her veins were popping out of her neck. She looked like a one-woman horror movie and she was thumping the table and thumping me. She grabbed me by the shoulders and shook me like a dog shakes a rag doll. Snot-nosed bitch of a bastard, living in my house under my roof. You'd be dead in that orphanage if I hadn't gotten you out and nursed you around the clock. You come here and eat the food, keep me running after you, and then go out and shame me. You better straighten up, girl, or I'll throw you back where you came from. The gutter. Take your hands off me. If you ain't my real mother, then you just take your goddamn hands off me. I ran out the door and tore all the way over the wheat fields up into the woods. The sun had gone down, and there is one finger of rose left in the sky. So what? So what, I'm a bastard. I don't care. She's trying to scare me. She's always trying to throw some fear in me. The hell with her, and the hell with anyone else if it makes a difference to them. Goddamn Broccoli Detweiler and his ugly dick anyway. He got me in this mess, and just when we're making money, this has to happen. I'm going to get Earl Stanback and lay him out to whale shit if it's the last thing I do. Yeah, then Mom will rip me for that. 
I wonder who else knows I'm a bastard. I bet Mouth knows, and if Florence the megaphone Mouth knows, the whole world knows. I bet they're all sitting on it like hens. Well, I ain't going back into the house for them to laugh at me and look at me like I'm a freak. I'm staying out here in these woods, and I'm going to kill Earl. Shit, I wonder if old Brock got it. He'll tell I put him up to it and skin out. Coward. Anyone with a dick like that's got to be chicken shit anyway. I wonder if any of the kids know. I can face Mouse and Mom, but not the gang. Well, if it makes a difference to them, the hell with them, too. I can't see why it's such a big deal. Who cares how you get here? I don't care. I really don't care. I got myself born. That's what counts. I'm here. Boy, old Mom was really roaring. She was ripped. Just ripped. I'm not going back there. I'm not going back to where it makes a difference, and she'll throw it in my face from now on out. Look how she throws in my face how I kicked Grandma Bolt's shins when I was five. I'm staying in these woods. I can live off nuts and berries, except I don't like berries. They got ticks on them. I can just live off nuts, I guess. Maybe kill rabbits. Yeah, but Ted told me rabbits are full of worms. Worms. Yuck, I'm not eating worms. I'll stay out here in these woods and starve. That's what I'll do. Then Mom will feel sorry about how she yelled at me and made a big deal out of the way I was born. I'm calling my real mother a slut? I wonder what my real mother looks like. Maybe I look like someone. I don't look like anyone in our house. None of the bolts, nor vegan leads, none of them. They all have extra white skin and gray eyes. German. They're all German. And don't carry make noise about that. How anyone else is bad. Wops and Jews and the rest of the entire world. That's why she hates me. I bet my mother wasn't German. My mother couldn't have cared about me very much if she left me with Carrie. Did I do something wrong way back then? Why would she leave me like that? Now, maybe now she could leave me after showing off Broccoli's dick, but when I was a little baby, how could I have done anything wrong? I wish I'd never heard of any of this. I wish Carrie Bolt would drop down dead. That's exactly what I wish. I'm not going back there. Night drew around the woods, and little unseen animals burrowed in the dark. There was no moon. The black filled my nostrils, and the air was full of little noises, weird sounds. A chill came up off the old fish pond down by the pine trees. I couldn't find any nuts either. It was too dark. All I found was a spider's nest. The spider's nest did it. I decided to go back to the house, but only until I was old enough to get a job so I could leave that dump. Stumbling, I felt my way home and opened up the torn screen door. No one was waiting up for me. They'd all gone to bed. That was chapter one. Here's chapter two. Leroy sat in the middle of the potato patch, picking a tick off his navel. He looked like Baby Huey in the comics, and he was about as smart, but Leroy was my cousin, and in a dumb way, I loved him. We'd been sent out there to get potato bugs, but the sun was high and we were both tired off their chores. The grown-up women were in the house, and the men were off working. That was the summer of 1956 and we were in such bad shape that we had to live with the Denmans in Shiloh. I didn't know we were in bad shape. Besides, I liked being out there with Leroy, Ted, and all the animals. Leroy was eleven, same age as me. He was the same height, only fat. I was skinny. Ted, Leroy's brother, was thirteen, and his voice was changing. Ted worked down at the Esso station, so Leroy and I were stuck with the potato bugs. Molly, I don't want to pick bugs no more. We got two jars full. Let's go on down to Mrs. Hershner's and get soda. Okay, but we gotta go down by the gully where Ted wrecked the tractor, or my mom will see us and make us get back to work. We crawled through the gully, past the rusty tractor, and out the drain pipe to the other side of the dirt road. Then we ran all the way down to Miss Hershner's tiny store, which had a faded Nehi soda sign with a thermometer on it tacked to the door. Well, it's Leroy and Molly. You children have been helping your mothers up there on the hill. 
Oh, yes, Mrs. Hirschner, Leroy droned. We spent this whole day picking potato bugs so the potatoes will grow right. Now, aren't you just sweet? Here, how about a chocolate tasty cake for each of you? Thank you, Mrs. Hirschner, in unison. Can I get a scoop of raspberry ice cream for a nickel? I grabbed my ice cream and walked out into the June sunshine. Leroy strolled out with a fudge ripple, and we sat on the worn, flat wood planks of the porch. I spied an empty sun-made raisin box, nearly perfect except for the top was worn, lying there in the iridescent tar paper shavings in front of the store. What you want that for? I got plans for this. You wait and see. Come on, Maul. Tell me, and I'll help you. Can't tell you now. Here comes Barbara Spangenthal, and you know how she is. Yeah, right, gotta be a secret. Hi, Barbara, what you doing? Barbara mumbled something about a loaf of bread and disappeared inside. Barbara was Jewish, and Carrie was forever telling Leroy and me to keep away from her. She needn't have bothered. No one wanted to go near Barbara Spangenthal because she always had her hands on her pants playing with herself, and worse, she stank. Until I was fifteen, I thought that being Jewish meant you walked around with your hand in your pants. Barbara rolled out of the store. She was even fatter than Leroy, her arms full of fishel's bread. She started down the footpath with all the honeysuckles. Hey, Barbara, you seen Earl Stanback today? He was down by the pond. Why? Because I got a present for him. You see him, you tell him I'm looking for him. Here? Barbara, filled with the importance of her message, trotted down the road. Since she lived closest to the Stanbacks, there was a good chance she'd deliver it. What do you want to give Earl Stanback a present for? I thought you hated him since forever. I do hate him, and the present I got for him is something very special. You want to come with me while I get it? Leroy fell over himself in enthusiasm, and he trailed me back over the fields like a duck after its mother, all the way babbling about what the present's going to be. We went into the cool woods, and I searched the ground. Leroy was looking at the ground, too, although he didn't know what he was looking for. Ha! I got it. Now I'm going to fix him good. I don't see nothing but a pile of rabbit turds. What you going to do? Come on and tell. Just watch Leroy and shut your trap. I scooped up a handful of tiny, perfectly round rabbit turds and put them in the sun-made raisin box. Remember the dried raisins that Florence had out in the back porch? You go on down there and steal me a handful and come right back here. Leroy took off like a cement truck, his bulk shimmering in the afternoon sun. Within ten minutes, he was back with a precious handful of honest raisins. I put them in the box and shook the contents hard. Then, swearing Leroy to eternal secrecy, I started through the woods to Carmine's fish pond to find Earl Sandback. He was down there all right, sitting there with a stick for a fishing pole, waiting for non-existent fish to bite a string with no bait on it. Earl was pretty stupid. The only way he made it through fourth grade was by brown-nosing the teacher. We were now going into sixth grade, and he still couldn't get beyond five on the multiplication tables. Florence said it was because the standbacks had so many kids that none of them ate enough, so Earl's brain was starved. I didn't much care why he was stupid. I was too busy hating him. He was all the time ratting on me in school because I was breaking this rule or that rule. Last time, I was sent to Mr. Beaver's office for stealing tablets out of the supply room. That was one week before school ended, and I nearly didn't get out of fifth grade because of it. Earl might be stupid, but he learned how to survive, and he learned at my expense, the mealy-mouthed weasel. Earl heard us coming and looked up. A perplexed shadow ran across his face because he must have thought I was going to whip him for sure. So I smiled and said, Hey, Earl, hey, you catching anything? No, but I got a big bite just five minutes ago. It must have been a tuna because it was sure big. Is that so? You must be a talented fisherman. Earl giggled and his left eye twitched. He couldn't figure this no way. Earl, I've been thinking that we got to stop irritating each other. Now you know I hate it when you stool on me, and I know you hate it when I get mad at you and lay for you on your way home from school. Why don't we call it truce and be friends? I won't beat you up if you don't tell on me when we go back to school. 
Sure, Molly, sure. I'd like us to be friends, and I swear on a stack of Bibles I won't tell of you ever again. Well, here then. I brought you a little present to make it legal. I just got them at Miss Hirshner's because I know you love raisins. Thanks. Hey, thanks. Earl snatched the raisin box, tore off what was left of the top, and opened his mouth, tipped the box over, and gulped half the contents in one motion. Leroy started to laugh. I grabbed his left arm and gave him a pinch that would have ruined an orange. You hush your mouth or I'll whip your ass, I hissed. I ain't worried, Molly. I ain't gonna laugh. What are you two talking about? Oh, we was remarking how fast you eat, Earl. We ain't never seen anyone eat quite so fast. Why, you must be the fastest eater in all of York County. I bet you can finish off the rest of the box in half a second. Don't you think so, Leroy? Yeah, Earl Stanback has got true speed. He even eats faster than my old man. Earl bloated up with all this praise, and he ruffled out his feathers. Oh, I can do it in less than half a second. You watch me. One fierce swallow in the sun-made reading box was tossed into the pond. Earl was beaming and feeling big on himself. Earl, how did those raisins taste? Like raisins. Some were mushy and bitter, though. Mushy? Now, ain't that the strangest thing? Leroy exploded with laughter and fell down on the grass next to the pond. Earl, you are so stupid. You know that. Earl, you're so stupid. Molly gave you a box full of rabbit turds mixed with raisins. Earl's face crumpled under the blow. You didn't do that, did you, Molly? You bet I did, you sneaking fart. You rat on me one more time, and I'm going to do a whole lot worse, so you'd better lay off me, Earl Stanback. Let this be a lesson to you. I took a threatening step toward him for effect, but Earl was so green he wasn't worried about the outside of his body. I won't ever tell on you again. I promise, I promise. Cross my heart and hope to die. Die is the right word, boy. You button your fat lip, and if you even breathe a single word that I fed you rabbit turds, you've had it. Come on, Leroy. Let's leave him here, full of shit. We scurried over the pine needles, and Leroy was laughing so hard he could barely keep his footing. I turned round on the rim of the hill to look at Earl down by the edge of the pond, retching his guts out and crying at the same time. Fixed him good, I thought. I fixed him real good, and he deserves it. How come I don't feel good about it? He ain't gonna bother you no more, Molly. You got him this time. Shut up, Leroy. You shut up. Leroy stopped for a minute and looked at me with amazement, then shrugged his shoulders and said, We better get on back home before Carrie and the mouse come looking for us. And that was chapter two. So I've just read chapters one and two of Ruby Fruit Jungle by Rita Mae Brown. I hope you enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun reading this book, and it was a different experience reading it all by myself as opposed to sharing the chapter on Kyle's channel. So I hope you liked it, and please let me know what you thought of the chapter, and if you like hearing me read. And I'd like to know what your favorite part of the chapter was. So far, I'm kind of really liking the characters' last names, and they just feel old-fashioned to me. Like the woman who owns the store, Mrs. Hirschner. So let me know what you think about the chapters. And I'll be recording the next couple of chapters very soon. Thanks. Good night, guys.